This is the section on compressor anti-stall and engine inlet ice protection. First, anti-stall systems. When we talk about jet engine stall, we're talking about the compressor blades stalling, the blades that are increasing the number of molecules per cubic inch and increasing the pressure of the air going into the combustion chamber. Another term for this is compressor surge because the airflow uh, is not smooth flowing anymore. The airflow can go up and in particular when the airflow goes down we're pretty unhappy because the engine's not going to work very well if we don't have airflow going through the combustion chamber. Off-design airflow is what causes compressor stall. That's one way to describe it. Off-design airflow is when the air going through the engine is not what the engineer originally intended. The vast majority of the time, the engineers have taken care of all of the possibilities. But every now and then, something happens. Um, essentially, just like when you were a private pilot memorizing the answers to the FAA written tests and the FAA said what causes an airplane wing to stall you say it exceeds its critical angle of attack well really that's the same for compressor blades they're subsonic airflow and if the angle of attack goes higher than it can handle the uh, airflow will stall and the blades won't work anymore there are two basic contributing factors to uh, compressor stalls. One of them is the air velocity going too slow. This ought to make a little bit of sense because it's easier to stall a small aircraft with a subsonic airflow wing, a subsonic airfoil, when you're going slow. Also, the RPMs of the engine going too high increases the angle of attack. So for the amount of angle of attack you have, if the velocity is too low, then it'll stall. You can reduce the airflow velocity so it's low, but only if you reduce the RPMs. So these are actually tied together. If the airflow velocity is too low for as fast an RPM as you're running the engine, then you're going to get a compressor stall. There's a uh, three basic operational causes that when you're in the airplane and you have a helicopter and you have a compressor stall, it's likely to be uh, it's going to be one of these three causes. Uh, a rapid attitude change that would affect the airflow going into the engine. For instance, if we've got our... Uh, oh, that's a pretty lousy airplane. Here's our airplane and we'll say there's an engine on the tail. As you're going down the runway... I suppose we could put wings on it and stuff. In any case, as you're going down the runway, the airflow is going straight into the engine. So our pitch is zero, our yaw is zero. However, when we uh, turn, uh, pitch the airplane up, for rotation, and I'm exaggerating a bit here, the airflow isn't coming straight into the engine anymore. So if this is a really rapid pitch change, or if we were flying along in the airplane in flight, and we yawed the airplane one way or the other, we could make the airflow into the engine be uh, changed very rapidly. And this could affect the airflow inside of the inlet and therefore inside of the compressor. Another way to do this is severe turbulence. Let's say we're flying along, here's our jet engine. And all of a sudden, we hit a 6,000 feet per minute updraft. Instead of the air going into the engine nice and smoothly, it's pushing the air out of the way. So for a moment there, there may be little or no air actually going through the engine. So that means the airflow velocity in the compressor is going to be much, much slower, even though we have a nice high RPM. And then the most common type of uh, having compressor stalls, and eh, maybe not more common, but yeah, I guess it's most common, is rapid engine acceleration and deceleration. The good thing about this is we can do something about this. Let's talk about rapid acceleration first. And when I'm saying acceleration, I'm talking about rapid engine RPM acceleration. So we got our basic jet engine here. If the engine is accelerating, these blades are rotating around and those compressor blades 
are going to be hitting the air at a higher angle of attack because they're going faster. We need that airflow velocity to speed up through the engine to catch up, that is to match the speed of the RPM of the engine. But every time we accelerate, we're going to, only going to be able to do this by increasing fuel burn, blowing faster air across the turbines, and having energy go to the compressor. So the compressor is going to have to speed up in RPMs before the airflow velocity through the compressor can go up. So there's always going to be a little bit of a lag on that higher velocity catching up with the higher engine RPM. So engine acceleration could cause a compressor stall or a compressor surge. Okay, now deceleration. When we decelerate the RPMs again, that's engine RPMs, it's because we're going to burn less fuel and blow across the turbines. If we're burning less fuel here, that means the velocity going to the turbines, the velocity gets less than it was before. But we have a lot of airflow trying to come into the combustion section. If the velocity of the airflow right here cannot is not going as fast, then this air coming into the combustion chamber is going to hit air that used to be gone. So the air is going to get backed up. It's going to get... Uh, you're going to get too many air molecules in here, and so the velocity right here, the velocity is going to slow down. Well, the RPMs of the engine, if they are still going fast, because we just barely turned off some of the fuel, then we're going to have a slow velocity through the compressor, even though the engine is still spinning RPM, and the RPMs are going to have to catch up to the slower airflow. In, either ca in this case, the RPMs are going to be too high for the slower airflow and c could cause a compressor stall. Now you're in the cockpit, that's where, it's where we want to be, right? And uh, you need to know what might you see or hear or feel to know that you're having a compressor stall. These numbers are right out of these words are right out of the book. Rumble, chuggling, buzzing, maybe a loud, low pitch pop. The EGT might fluctuate for a second or two. It might go up a little bit because uh, because if we have less airflow, if the airflow is impeded and we don't have much, as good an airflow as normal as an airflow, as high as an airflow in volume, in molecules per second going through the combustion chamber, the EGT would rise because we're burning the same amount of fuel and not having as much air. The EPR, if you got an EPR gauge, is probably going to fluctuate, and this is going to interrupt. This is going to reduce our thrust, so the EPR might go down a little bit, and the RPMs are probably going to fluctuate as well. So those are the indications of... Oh, wait, sorry, got some more. This one I just found out, I was reading about. Uh, if you're having a compressor stall and you change the th power lever setting, the engine is having a rough time of it already. It may not be able to do... It's going to have to recover from that stall before a change in fuel flow will uh, change the engine RPM or the EPR. So during a compressor stall, the power lever uh, might not help very much, especially if you're pushing it forward. And the worst thing that's likely to occur during a compressor stall, which is very unlikely, is you have a flame out. That airflow going through the engine could be so interrupted and slowed down so much that not enough air is getting into the combustion chamber. And although you're squirting fuel in there, if you burn up all the air in there, the flame won't stay lit. Since centrifugal compressors uh, are, can handle off-design airflow better, centrifugal compressors have le are less likely to have compressor stalls than are axial flow compressors. But of course, axial flow compressors, if we put enough axial stages in there, then we can have a really nice high compression and have a really uh, low TSFC. What do you do? in case you have a compressor stall. Pull the power lever aft. Reduce RPM. If uh, too high of an RPM for too low of an airflow is can cause a compressor stall, then one of the things you can do is reduce that RPM. The other thing is, if you ha are having a compressor stall because of a rapid pitch change or a rapid uh, yaw change, that is a rapid attitude change, then push put the engine in line with the airflow so the velocity will go up so essentially this is increasing the velocity going in the air going and this is reducing the rpm 
which are these both exactly the opposite of things that will cause a compressor stall. The good thing is, yay, is that compressor stalls almost always correct themselves. They usually only take a second or two. By the time you notice it, it's over. If, however, uh, if you have a compressor stall, it's typically not that big of a deal, unless for some reason you suspect engine damage. Um, if it does happen more than once, you need to write it up so somebody can figure out why it's happening frequently. And, of course, if the engine flames out, definitely you're going to want to write it up to make sure that maintenance takes a look to find out what's going on as well. Now, anti-stall systems. We're talking about anti-stall systems for the compressor. is going to allow us to have rapid and smooth acceleration and deceleration of the engine. Hey, that's what we do with jet engines, right? We push the power lever forward, we pull the power lever aft, especially if we're in a military jet and we're trying to shoot somebody out of the sky or keep from getting shot out, we're going to be changing the power settings a lot. We want the engine to be able to accelerate and decelerate through its RPMs from idle all the way to takeoff power and not be worried about the engine having a compressor stall or a compressor sturge. Um, hopefully you know this one already and that's because compressors are fixed pitch blades unlike a constant speed propeller like on a Piper Seminole where the blade can change pitch to maintain optimum thrust and also keep the blade from stalling uh, turbine engines, the compressor blades and the turbine blades for that matter are all fixed pitch so if we change airflow we're going to be changing the angle of attack so we got to be careful Okay, there are two ways that, there are two different types of systems that are anti-stall systems, compressor anti-stall systems that you're going to find on turbine engines. One of them is to use variable pitch compressor stators. And you're going, oh, wait a minute, Mr. Johnson, you just said that nobody had variable pitch. Oh, wait, the rotating blades are fixed pitch. But on some engines, in particular some big transport category jet engines, the stators will change pitch. They're not moving, but they'll change pitch. For instance, the rotor. You notice it doesn't change pitch, but the stator is changing pitch. So there's a pivot point right here, and the blade, the stator can pivot. It's not rotating, spinning around and around and around like the compressor blade but it can pivot and change pitch and control the airflow going into the uh, the next blade and that is going to be dependent on RPM the faster the RPM the uh, different we're going to differing pit, uh, angle we're going to need for the air to leave the stator to hit the compressor blade at the right angle I'll beware this is variable stators variable stators so here's a picture off of a axial compressor, probably on a big transport category jet, and this here is the stator. The stator can change pitch. Stator can change pitch. On top of each one of these stators is an arm, and this arm is connected to a ring that goes all the way around the engine. Here you can see all these arms off of each of these stators, stationary blades, and when this ring around it is pulled down or pushed up, all of these blades in underneath it are going to change pitch. So we can hook each of these rings up together on a bar and move this whole bar up or this whole bar down and we can change pitch of all the stators inside of this axial compressor. The fuel control. If there's any component on the engine that knows what's going on with the engine, it's the fuel control. It's got all those inputs, it's got all those outputs. One of those outputs is controlling the compressor anti-stall system and typically that bar that everything gets hooked up to and gets to be pushed up and down that's going to be powered by fuel pressure. The fuel control it knows what RPM the engine is at 
And so it knows when it's most likely, and we'll get to that here shortly, when you're going to have a compressor stall. So it uses fuel pressure, like a hydraulic system, to push that bar up and down. It's a hydraulic type actuator, but it uses fuel instead of hydraulic fluid to push it. Now, what's happening is in this system is that these those stators, if you're looking down on top of it, that stator, it changes pitch very slowly. It changes pitch very slowly. So your gauge indication of system operation is none. You're not going to notice if you're looking at that RPM gauge or you're looking at the EPR gauge. Oops. The EPR gauge, you're not going to notice that when you change when you grab the power lever on the throttle quadrant and you pull it down or you push it up, the RPMs are going to go down smoothly or the RPMs are going to go up smoothly. The EPR is going to go down smoothly or the EPR is going to go up smoothly and you're not going to see any indication. There's no cockpit gauge indication telling you the pitch of those stationary blades. Also, if you are in a military jet, you're going to have to be yanking and cranking and pushing the throttle forward and pulling the throttle back all the time to fight off the bad guys. So in front of that rotating blade, there's a rotating blade. It's very common to put a set of inlet guide vanes. IGV is inlet guide vanes. And literally, this is just an extra set of compressor uh, stators that can be variable pitch and that helps this engine be able to withstand more very very rapid changes in throttle setting and of course rapid attitude changes as well as you're yanking and cranking doing aerobatics. The second type of compressor anti-stall system is called bleed valves. Bleed valves are a set of valves that allow air to bleed off of the compressor, hence the term bleed valves. If you have a certain airflow velocity through the compressor, if you want to not have a stall, compressor stall, you want this velocity to be high in comparison with the RPMs. So if you open up a hole in the aft portion of the compressor and you bleed air out, then the velocity of this air is higher because the pressure outside of the engine is lower compared to the pressure inside of the engine. So these air molecules will speed up. So the molecule right upwind of it will speed up. The molecule upwind of it will speed up. The molecule upwind of it will speed up. So if we bleed some air off of the engine, the velocity going through the compressor will go up and so instead of having to reduce RPM to prevent a compressor stall by doing it manually by pulling the power lever aft this will speed the velocity up. If we bleed air off then this mo these molecules will go some of them, now obviously you're not bleeding all of the air off but you're increasing the average airflow through the engine so that you're less likely to have a compressor stall. And here's a picture of a set of bleed valves. Of course the engine is missing here. The engine's in here and the compressors in the front of here and the airflow's coming in this direction and here are these valves located all the way around the engine and these are going to be actuated again by typically by fuel pressure although sometimes by pneumatic pressure uh, by, and it's going to be controlled by the fuel control. Now there's a subdivision of bleed valves. If you look like at a Pratt & Whitney JT8D, like on old 727s, all 727s, old 737s, DC9s, the older MD80s, these Pratt & Whitney JT8Ds, they had bleed valves going all the way around the engine. And when the fuel control decided that it was the RPM for these to open, they would all open at once. They'd essentially pop open. It'd just be like boom. So if you were looking at N1 RPM or you were looking at EPR, you'd notice a shift. You'd notice that needle wiggle when these opened up. And then when they closed, 
since they're affecting how much air is going through the engine, when they close, you'd see an EPR shift and you'd see an, an RPM shift as well. So some of these, the older systems, they're either full open or full closed because they pop open or they pop closed. However, there are some newer engines, same system, except at a certain RPM, these valves open very slowly, and then at a higher RPM, these valves open, close very slowly. So as you're advancing the throttle lever, the power lever up and down, you see a nice smooth EPR go up, EPR go down, and or a smooth uh, RPM go up or smooth RPM go down. So in that case, you wouldn't be able to see it. And the fuel control is always going to do the controlling. Here, let's cross out this word right here. The fuel control is always going to be in charge of operating anti-stall systems. The fuel control might do the actuating off of fuel pressure, or I have seen some bleed valves that are pneumatically powered with bleed air off of the engine being used to power the valves opening and closing. And I already talked about the EPR and RPM shifts. Now, when do these things operate? Zero, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety, hundred. Okay, let's just say that fifty percent is idle and that a hundred percent is redline. Hopefully this looks reasonably familiar on our generic jet engine. The time when these compressor anti-stall systems, variable pitch stators or bleed valves, the engine, if it's working up here at normal cruise power settings, the engine's doing what it's supposed to, what the engineer planned on. Down here at idle, the engine's not doing anything other than just running and not having a flame out or having any other issues. So the time that you're going to see stators, variable pitch stators and bleed valves operate to prevent compressor stall due to rapid acceleration and deceleration is going to be between 60% and 80%. Because after we get past 80, we're getting close to where the engine is supposed to operate. So the RPMs versus the engine uh, airflow velocity is correct. And down here at idle, the engine's going to keep running reasonably easily. So this big change in, in RPM versus airflow is going to be happening between 60 and 70%. So let's just say we have stators, variable pitch stators. They're going to start moving at 60% and they will be full in the opposite position by the time it's 80 percent and then they don't move anymore they're going to stay at that optimum pitch to give optimum angle of attack the rest of the time if we pull the power lever back and we come back below 80 they'll start moving back to where they were and by the time you get the rpms down to 60 the stators will be in the opposite extreme pitch and then they won't be moving between 50 and 60 percent same thing for bleed valves. Of course, these numbers here I'm giving you are generic, but they work out pretty good. Bleed valves are going to be closed between 50 and 60 percent, and as we push the power lever past 60 percent, the fuel control, which is measuring engine RPM, is going to either pop those valves full open and leave them full open and then slam them shut at 80 percent, or if it's a... Uh, has bleed valves that open and close slowly, they'll start opening at 60 stay wide open and then they'll be closed by the time they get to 80 again. So in any case the only time that these compressor anti-stall systems are really working is during that acceleration and deceleration and they're not doing anything between idle and 60 and they're not doing anything between 80 and 100. Dun, dun, dun. And of course Compressor anti-stall systems are only there to prevent compressor stalls due to rapid acceleration and rapid deceleration of the engine. The compressor anti-stall systems will not stop compressor stalls due to rapid attitude changes nor due to flying through severe turbulence. If you have any questions about anti-stall systems, please let me know. If you have any suggestions on how to improve this lecture, please let me know.
Okay, ice protection. What does ice protection do for jet engines? Now, uh, you got to understand, we're just covering ice protection systems for engines. This does not cover anything about the airframe, which is a whole other bunch of stuff. Typically, the most likely uh, anti-icing system to keep ice from sticking to the inside of the inlet of a jet engine is to take hot bleed air, 200 to 400 degrees Celsius, off of one of the rear stages of the compressor where it's nice and hot and then pump it forward. So here's a two spool engine. If we take bleed air from one of the last stages we can run it through a regulating valve so it's not too hot and here would be the on off valve that we would be operating from the cockpit and we can run this into the leading edge of the intake. Of course, there's got, it's got to get out, so some of this air is going to end up getting sucked back in the engine. If we have some kind of inlet guide vanes, we can run this bleed air through it, and if that's the case, we can run it through the bullet or the, the, uh, the spinner, if you will, on the front of the jet engine, or if there's no inlet guide vanes, we could actually run it through a hollow shaft to heat the bullet out in the front. So this is works out really, really well. We've got an engine. We can take bleed air off of it, and we can run it out and keep the surface of our jet engine parts hot so ice can't stick to it. Works out really, really well. And the valves, we're going to flip a switch, it's going to be electrically operated, and of course there's going to be a temperature regulating valve, so the metal of the intake of the engine doesn't get too hot. If it's made out of aluminum, aluminum melts at 1100 degrees Fahrenheit, and if it gets higher than 650 degrees Fahrenheit, the aluminum is actually damaged, so we converted that into degrees Celsius. I wonder what that would be. Okay. The problem with taking bleed air off of a jet engine is that if we have an engine and we're taking some bleed air off and heating up that intake, some of that bleed air comes into the engine. So we're, he we're heating the air up and of course the air expands. So if the air expands, there's less molecules per cubic inch. And, of course, that's going to reduce our thrust a little bit. Also, if we take bleed air off of the compressor, that means that we're burning fuel just to compress air to make it hot instead of use it for engine purposes. So our uh, TSSC is going to go down a little bit. Oh, wait, there it is. TSSC is going to go down a little bit because our fuel flow is going to go up if we keep the same amount of thrust. Now... Whether it's part 91 or part 121, in either place it says you have to take into account the weather when you're doing a flight plan. That includes whether or not there's forecast or icing conditions. Or known icing conditions, rather. Known icing conditions is when someone's been up there and they've reported it and they know it's there. Forecast just means the meteorologists think it's going to happen. If it's in either case, either forecast icing or known icing, whether it's part 91 or part 121, if you know, or you think, you know that you're going to fly through icing conditions and you're going to have to take bleed air off of the engine to run your anti-icing systems and you're going to burn more fuel, you have to add that fuel onto the airplane before takeoff. You cannot, I repeat, you cannot just plan on using it out of your reserve fuel. So when you go to do your fuel planning before takeoff, you have to take into account if it's forecast or or and if it's known icing, and if so, either case, you're going to have to put more fuel on board the airplane to make sure you don't run out of gas in the end. What do you see from the cockpit when you turn on your engine anti-icing systems? Well, typically, you're going to see an EPR shift and or an RPM shift. If you're developing the same power, it's going to be very, very, very slightly 
increased EGT you might not even notice it and you probably aren't going to notice it because it's going to be a very very slightly increased fuel flow for the same power uh, just looking at the gauges you're probably not going to notice but over the long run over a flight definitely this fuel flow is going to be noticed so that's why you're going to have to put more fuel on board the airplane another way to heat up the airframe or correction to heat up the engine intake is to run uh, electric heating elements in the leading edges of the intake duct just like a pitot tube you convert electrical energy into heat and that keeps the leading edges hot same thing if you have an EPR probe and you you don't want to blow bleed air across it otherwise you might impact the accuracy of the pressure reading that it's trying to take so that EPR probe gets heated up as well just like uh, a heated pitot tube does okay I'm not going to ask you to memorize any numbers but if you're on the ground and there is visible moisture and it's a little bit above freezing or close to freezing it's very possible that you could get icing inside of that engine you gotta understand even when the engine is running at idle you're sucking air in at 100 to 200 knots inside the intake so the static pressure in here is going to go down a little bit just like in a carburetor if you had an inventory the velocity goes up and the static pressure goes down and because the static pressure goes down water can freeze at a higher than normal temperature so same thing inside of your intake if the pressure is below normal below atmospheric then you could have ice forming that is the water vapor uh, it's in a vapor state when it's exposed to a lower pressure it will go down from its state of matter vapor or gas to a liquid to a solid and the vaporous water may skip from a liquid and go straight to a solid and stick on the inside so if you see visible moisture we're talking you look out the window and you see clouds you look out the window and you see fog rain snow ice those are visible maybe we ought to say visible h2o and it's a little bit above freezing or close to freezing then if you're on the ground you need to turn on the engine anti-ice on the ground otherwise you could accumulate ice and then of course when you go to take off power setting it's possible it might suck the ice in and damage the engine if you're at cruise uh, then it's a little bit different you're gonna wanna turn on the switch you're only going to turn it on in cruise conditions if you're in icing conditions if possible if you see it ahead of you you're going to turn on the switch in advance because anti is talking about keeping the ice from forming you don't want the ice to form on the intake because if the ice forms on the intake and then you turn on the anti ice then the surface of the intake will heat up and the ice will break off and get sucked in the engine and could damage the engine. In fact, if you're on the ground and you forget to turn on the anti-ice and it ices up inside of the engine, what you need to do is shut the engine off and come out here and manually break the ice off and pull it out by hand, literally somebody do it by hand, and then start the engine back up. You do not want to turn on the anti-ice once the ice is formed, if at all possible. Of course, if you're in flight and it gets iced up, then you're not going to have any choice it's only going to get worse so if you're in flight and you don't turn it on soon enough you're still going to have to turn it on so it doesn't get any worse now if you're if this line right here is sea level and way up here is 36,000 feet most of the weather where there's icing conditions is somewhere from sea level up higher. If you look at thunderstorms and stuff, most of it where the icing could occur doesn't happen above 36,000 feet. So if you're flying along at 36,000 feet, you're typically not in icing conditions very often. But if you're descending on approach to land, or if you've just taken off and you're climbing to cruise, that's when you're most likely to fly through icing conditions. So these two flight situations 
are climbing and descending. Oops. Are the most likely times where you're going to have icing. Also, if you have that jet engine and there happens to be, you just didn't quite turn on the anti icing system in time and some of that ice broke off and goes through the engine, if there was enough, it, of course it'll get melted inside of the compressor because it's going to get hot. It could negatively affect the combustion process inside of the engine and cause a flame out. So just prior to turning on engine anti-icing systems, you're going to turn on the ignition system so that in case there is a flame out, it'll catch the fuel on fire right away without any delay. Also, if you're in a multi-engine airplane, you're going to turn anti-ice on one engine, especially this is in flight, you know, turn on the anti-ice to continuous and then turn on the ant turn on the ignition to continuous and then turn on the anti-ice to one engine make sure the engine's running all right then do it to the next engine and the next and the next there's actually a, a circumstance where there was a big four engine plane and they turned on all the anti-icing on all engines simultaneously and there was a little bit of ice in each engine and it caused all four engines to flame out simultaneously. So lesson here is just do one engine at a time. It only takes about five or ten seconds to wait. Make sure the engine's going to work good and then turn on the next one. So by the time you're done turning them all on, it's been less than 30 seconds. If you have any questions about ice protection systems, please get a hold of me. If you have any suggestions on how to do this lecture better, please get a hold of me and let me know what those suggestions are. Thank you.